This is going to be a video talking about lumbar spinal fusion surgery, what it is, the common conditions that it's used for, the different types of procedures, and a general recovery and rehab timeline. So to get started, spinal fusion surgery is a procedure where bone graft is inserted into a spinal segment, which grows between adjacent segments and fuses them together. The graft can either be an autograft, which is taken from the individual's own body, an allograft, which is taken from a cadaver, or is manufactured using a synthetic substitute. One level fusions are most common and up to four or full lumbar fusions can be performed, but are rare. Degenerative changes typically at L4, L5 spinal level, making this the most common spinal motion segment fused during surgery. Generally, fusion surgery is considered for individuals with abnormal or excessive motion at a vertebral segment that causes severe pain and an inability to function. Before we get into it, let's go over the anatomy of the vertebrae that make up our spine. Each vertebrae is comprised of the body in the front, the arch in the back, which is made up of two pedicles that project posteriorly, two laminae that unite in the middle, a spinous process or the tip you can feel sticking out, two transverse processes that project out on each side of the spinous process, and one upper pair and one lower pair of articular processes that make up the facet joints. The spinous processes and transverse processes act as muscle attachment points for various muscles in your back. The arch and the posterior aspect of the body create the vertebral foramen, or hole, and successive foramina form the vertebral canal through which the spinal cord travels. If you stack vertebrae and look at them from the side, you'll see that the bodies in the front, the articular processes in the back, and the pedicles on the top and bottom form what are called vertebral notches making these intervertebral foramina where spinal nerves emerge from. Cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebrae have distinguishing characteristics and all look slightly different from one another because of the different demands and needs for that part of the spine. Cervical vertebrae have transverse foramen that house the vertebral artery. Thoracic vertebrae have costal facets that articulate with the ribs. And lumbar vertebrae have massive bodies for increased weight-bearing demands. So who typically undergoes spinal fusion surgery? Some of the most common conditions include spinal stenosis, bulging disc, disc herniation, degenerative disc disease, spondylolisthesis, myelopathy, synovial cysts, and facet arthropathy. There are two main categories of spine surgery. There is decompression surgery that involves removing parts of the disc or the vertebrae in order to decrease pressure or pinching of spinal nerves. The different types include disectomies, facetectomies, foraminotomies, laminectomies, and laminotomies. The ending otomy means the removal of something, so in these cases, the different surgeries are the removal of whatever the first part of the word is. The second category is stabilization spine surgery, which reduces or eliminates motion between vertebrae using plates, rods, or screws. In the next couple of slides, we'll go over each of the ones listed there. The first is anterior lumbar inner body fusion or ALIF. With an ALIF, surgeons have access to the entire ventral surface or the front of the exposed disc. The benefits of ALIF include less traumatic access compared to posterior approaches, resulting in less postoperative pain and shorter hospital stays. Posterior elements such as ligaments and muscles are also preserved with this, with this approach. However, it involves great vessel mobilization, which may lead to a DVT or a deep vein thrombosis and a direct injury to the vessels, abdominal organ injuries or incisional hernias. Next is the posterior lumbar interbody fusion or PLIF. These procedures are frequently used with acceptable fusion and low complication rates. It allows good visualization of neural structures as well as decompression bilaterally. However, they're limited by having to move back the membrane covering the spinal cord, called the thecal sac, and nerve root, as well as possible injury to the paraspinals and posterior ligaments that stabilize the spine. PLIF is usually limited to the lower lumbar, lumbar levels, like L3 to S1, to avoid damage to the cord. Then we have transferaminal lumbar interbody fusion, or TLIF. This approach is more lateral than the PLIF and gives unilateral access to the intervertebral foraminal space, which can lower the risk of damage to important structures like nerve roots, dura, and ligaments, while still giving easy access to posterior structures like the lamina and facet joints. 
The lateral lumbar inner body fusion, or LLIF, accesses the disc space via a lateral retroperitoneal trans-psoas approach, which basically means that it goes behind the peritoneum, which is the tissue lining the abdominal wall and organs, and goes through the psoas muscle. There is an increased risk of injury at lower lumbar levels due to the network of interlacing nerves and vessels, as well as injury to the psoas muscle. Additionally, spinal levels L5 to S1 can't be targeted because of the iliac crest, which is the bone you feel when you put your hands on your hips that gets in the way with this approach. Finally, we have the oblique lumbar inner body fusion anterior to psoas or OLIF ATP approach, which grants access to the disc space between the psoas muscle and the inferior vena cava, which is a major vein in the body. Like the LLIF approach, it doesn't require posterior surgery or stripping of the spinal or paraspinal musculature. Unlike that approach, it doesn't dissect or cross the psoas and can target levels L5 to S1 since it uses an oblique approach. Pictured is a table from a review article by Mobs et al. in 2015 listing the techniques most suitable for each spinal level. In the article, they looked at various studies comparing the different techniques to one another to see which one might be best, but there was no consensus on which procedure was best in terms of fusion or clinical outcomes. Overall, there are many factors that go into picking a surgical procedure, including the health status of the individual and goals or desired outcomes of the surgery. It's best to weigh the pros and cons with your surgeon. Talking about recovery and rehab, Individual factors play a role in long-term outcomes, including underlying conditions, health of surrounding segments, fusion level, and patient age. Factors that can slow the recovery process include smoking, obesity, osteoporosis, and chronic illnesses, such as those listed above. However, most patients experience some degree of improvement in their back pain. Patients typically spend two to four nights in the hospital post-surgery. And when it comes to the healing timeline, it usually takes three to six months for adjacent bones to fuse and 12 to 18 months for bones to solidify. It varies for each person, but it can take between three to eight months for an individual to feel recovered from surgery. The length of surgical recovery can vary depending on the type of surgery, the patient's overall health, and whether they're eligible for the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery program. Patients may be eligible for this program, which are evidence-based protocols for perioperative care and are utilized for different areas of surgery. The common goal is to improve surgical outcomes and patient experience, reduce complications and length of stay in the hospital. Some of the protocols cover pre-operative counseling and education, prehab, medication management, early mobilization, and in-hospital PT. Patients will be given opioids for pain and discomfort, which means that they won't be able to drive until they're off of them and haven't taken them for a few weeks. The surgeon will advise patients not to bend, lift objects overhead, or anything over 10 pounds, or twist. These are put into place to protect the spine and allow it to heal. In addition, they may give a brace to wear for a few weeks for some added stability, but over time, patients will gradually wean off the brace as they gain more muscular strength and stability. The general recovery timeline can be broken up into four phases. Different surgeons may have variations in their protocol, but they follow this timeline more or less. Phase one happens in the first six weeks. During this time, patients will begin inpatient rehab for the first five days and typically start PT starting anywhere between four to seven weeks after their discharge from the hospital. For the beginning of rehab, patients will work on bed mobility and how to perform self-care tasks. Assistance from friends or family members for daily tasks will be needed, especially during this time as they are recovering from surgery. Light walking is encouraged to start rebuilding aerobic endurance. Phase two occurs between six to 10 weeks after the surgery. The focus is on controlling pain and inflammation as everything starts to heal. Patients will slowly work up to around 30 minutes of exercise at least five times a week, which includes lightweight training made up of exercises that don't load the lumbar spine in order to build strength as well as incorporating a stabilization and reconditioning program to protect the spine and get the individ individual back to moving safely and without pain. And of course, an emphasis on maintaining good body mechanics with everything they do. In phase three, individuals may return to work with modifications, but this also depends on the type of work and may take longer for those with more labor intensive jobs and those who aren't recovering as quickly. 
patients continue to progress mobility, strength, and reconditioning programs, which involves adding resistance training and or pool therapy if accessible. Pain is expected to decrease during this time as well. Finally, phase four aims to return to the patient's prior level of function and continuing their conditioning and stabilization home exercise program as they gain more independence. Agility and sports specific drills may be introduced with clearance from the surgeon and supervision from the PT if there is a return to sport goal. Ultimately, the patient will need to maintain spinal health with regular exercise and good mechanics with all of their activities for the rest of their life. Throughout an individual's recovery, their physical therapist plays a vital role in providing manual and pain relief techniques, such as soft tissue and joint mobilizations and scar massage to improve soft tissue restrictions and spinal mobility, as well as decrease pain, introducing and progressing mobility and flexibility exercises, as well as strengthening and stabilization exercises, especially for the hips and core, in accordance with tissue healing times in order to move with adequate range of motion, but also control, incorporating functional training that mimics daily tasks and demands, and guide individuals on how to perform them correctly to avoid re-injury, and educating on proper body mechanics and good posture, including modifications for movements and activities, so that the individual can go about their daily routine and get back to doing the things they want to do safely and confidently. You can check out post-slow back procedure phases one through three videos on our YouTube channel for examples of exercises that your therapist may prescribe you. With that being said, all of the physical therapists at Orange County Physical Therapy are equipped with the knowledge, skills, and resources to be able to help you recover from your surgery, so schedule an appointment with OCPT today. Here are some references, and thanks for watching.